Okay, in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, our, we talked about the addition of fanboys and applying some of applying some of position theory, uh, yeah, position theory, and describing fanboys as sort of uh, position states that we can break down into smaller, but if we can see fast, we also uh, say that through another lemma. Uh, state your lemma that uh, any femboy such that it's a real component, right? It has real components, can be broken down into finitely many, uh, finitely many uh, position states. And <coughs> you can also, I want to add, <laughs> I also want to add that you can break down. So I'll name this corollary only. And hopefully, we can break down a business state template in real one. I'm going to attempt it. Then your combination of um, at position states. So we can do that because um, think of think of some <laughs> paradox. So if I'm gonna travel along this fixed distance, say uh, from zero to one, when it's the interval. Zero, 1 let's say I want to travel this interval. I want to walk along this interval. Now, in order to travel the entire distance, right, I'm going to have to travel half of it first, right? And then we'll travel the remaining half. So you can make some thick over here, which is one half, right? But the thing is, right, if we follow this principle over here, if we follow this principle of traveling one half the distance to get to the final point, that if you apply the first one, yeah, that means we're gonna have this one now. One fourth. So we have to travel now here. And then so if we apply that in one fourth and one, we get one uh one sixth again. Sixth. But then you know, so on so forth. So we can always make these divisions. And the paradox is that when we add up all these divisions over here, they all sum up to one. Even though there's some sort of infinite sort of division thing that goes on forever. Sorry, this one is not have six. And it's one. There's so this we can sum it up over here from n equals one to infinity, one over two and is equal to one. We add up all these divisions, they all just equal one. And that's the paradox. So like that, if we, we can break this down into finitely many f uh, such that if we add them up, even though they're infinite sort of thing or infinite series, they all just add up to f. So that's that's sort of the, the corollary that I want to add from previous lecture. So uh, now this one's this one's gonna be a bit heavy. It's gonna contain some topology, definitely some topology. And uh there's gonna be some proofs that I'm gonna omit, but there's one important theorem and a proof here that I'm gonna state, which is it's very that, that theorem that I'm gonna state is very important because it's gonna be our basic for when we start talking about F manifolds. Okay? When we start talking about fanboy man uh, F manifolds and yeah, manifolds in general. Now, I know we're already talking about manifolds this early into the study, but you guys already sort of expected that we're going to dive into advanced topics in this course. So, yeah. We'll see if I can use one of these guys. <laughs> okay, so let's start first with abelian blocks and relationships. So that's very important. So my first definition, first definition is that it's definition three. Yes, you want you guys cannot see that. Definition. 
அந்த மியூனியன் I will call alpha, not cal alpha, is a collection of first terms, is a collection of first terms, uh, which is B sub I, I indexed by a set J. You can see, still see that. Okay. Um, such that. A is finite, finite, uh, and contains an upper and lower bound. It contains an upper and lower bound, which I will I'll use. I'll use the notation of a supremum and an infimum. So the supremum and infimum, so that the upper bound, which I will call the, the supremum of this A, is our is that B, uh, well B upper and B lower, is B and the uh, infimum. Is B L or B lower? Over there. Okay. 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 Next term. Now, um, I haven't really established yet the point that this is well ordered, because um, not all Euclidean blocks are well ordered. So it's not just it's not the thing is it's not some ordered set. Um, and that the, the reason why they're called abelian or abelian blocks is because um, they have no order. They're like regular sets, and you can interchange the positions of each element. So um, let's say I have a let's say I have a, a set. Let's say I have a set. Uh, let's say I have a set uh, S is equal to um, P one P two. And P uh, omega, just for the sake of example. Well, um, use the brackets. This is the same as P two, P omega, and P one. And if you change the positions, it won't change. It's the same thing. That's the thing about um, not really well ordered sets because you can change the position of each element. But note that this is not equal to the well ordered set. P1 or 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 triplet three. It's not the same as this ordered triplet here. Okay, this is a well-ordered set, but this is not a well-ordered set. It's just a regular set. So there's a there's a distinction between a well-ordered set and a not well-ordered set. Any set could be well-ordered, you know, but uh, could define some. Uh, way of showing that they are well ordered. Like, if I want to say that this, uh, if I want to say that S equals to one of the ABC is strictly in this order, I need to say that this is defined by a list A1. I need to choose a bigger marker for that so that you can see it. So, if I want to Define order or say that this set is well ordered, I need to say something like this. So if I want to say that this set only has this word over here, it's only A, B, C, not A, C, or C, B, A, you say that, well, A is first. Uh, I'm going to use the set. And then B is second, B is and then C is And then this is the notion of. Um, that's just the notion of me saying that, well, A is first, B is second, and C is third. So if you want your set to be well ordered, you have to define some um, basis to say that, well, it's in this order and that order only. But um, even though you don't have this, your set can still be well ordered, okay? But if you want to specify order of a set, you definitely want to sort of do this kind of thing, like specify which elements go first, which elements go second, and so on and so forth. Okay. 
So next next definition, definition three. So you guys could note that already. Definition definition three. Definition three. An abelian block A is a collection. Oh no, that's three point one. This is a sub definition. So definition three point one. Point one, the definition is that there exists a abelian block which I will call alpha or display such that it is countably infinite and well ordered. Such that such that A is Countably infinite and well ordered. Well, ordered. and now when we start talking about well ordering and um well uh when we start talking about well ordering and uh, and countable infinities, you guys start to think about the natural numbers n. Um, now note that R is not countable. It's not countable. countable infinite. So, I think a counter example of this abelian block is that if we treat every person inside as some number, right? If we treat them as an n, so A, which is R, is is not countably infinite. Because um the thing about the thing about R or the real numbers is that um there's always gonna be a number right between two numbers. So like I said a while ago, um we're assuming a while ago in Zeno's paradox or the interval zero and one, you're assuming that, that this interval exists within R. We were assuming that this interval is inside R and that's and that, you know, we would make divisions inside of it, right? And the thing is, we can continue making divisions because it's part of the real numbers. It's the rational numbers, which are fractions, right? But the thing about natural numbers um, is that natural numbers are just, well, numbers that are whole. So basically integers, um, but excluding minus, right? So the, thing, the, the natural numbers is countably infinite. Because, well, it, it's infinite, yeah, we can keep going, but it doesn't have negative counterparts. Well, Z, or the integers, is also countably infinite. But something like R is not countably infinite. I know, you guys are probably going to say, well, if, if N and Z are part of R, and R is not countably infinite, how come they are countably infinite? It's because we take away those parts, such as the rationals uh, from R, uh, such that... Well, we can count between numbers, right? We can we can go from not one number and then step to the next without having to worry about numbers in between that, basically. So that's why R is not countably infinite, but N and Z are countably infinite. So, so, so going back to the definition, yeah, there is an abelian block A such that it is countably infinite and well ordered. So this A, actually not just A, but something we call A and A combined or A defined as a rational one, or a uh, national, not national, uh, real, uh, natural number, all right. So um, since this is well-ordered, since this A and is well-ordered, that means that each element inside of it has a complete successor. So there is always, given an A inside A n, A always has an immediate successor. Right. 
processor if and only if A is not equal to the infimum or supremum of big A. So as long as it's not the the upper bound, it's basically just the supremum, not the infimum. Infimum always has an upper bound. And it's a, it's a single concept. Okay. So now this is a small this is a thing, it's it's actually our this is our lemma one. Which is derived from our from the well ordering theorem. So the well ordering theorem, which is our theorem one, is that every abelian block A can be well ordered. So if our given abelian block A is well ordered, then uh, well especially A and N. A n is a, is a special case, and it actually is well ordered. Any a inside this a n or any person here has an immediate successor. So um, this notation is basically saying this a is basically saying we're treating every person inside a a given abelian block or abelian block as some number on the number line. Um, and so after that, well. Now that we have lemma one here, what if we apply this principle, this lemma, to the entire set? So if we apply lemma one on the entire set itself, because well, um, the set itself contains the set. The set has itself as uh, well, you know a set A contains itself A. Okay. Now if we don't use the comprehension principle, this holds true. Okay. And since A is an element of itself, we can apply the well ordering theorem. Or the well, we, we can apply lemma one on this on this fact, and so we can say now that even though a n is infinite, there's an infinity that's bigger than it. So it's the next tick. So if we have one, if we have one as a tick, and then two is the second tick, right? And then go infinity. After infinity, there's another tick, which is basically the next infinity, which is just you know one, two, three, all over again. So um, I'll write it down here as a picture. So I'll first write down our theorem. Or a lemma, uh, lemma two. Lemma two. There exists an A and omega that is well ordered. Now, in, in proving the, in using these lemmas and theorem one, which is the well ordering theorem, you might run into, or you will run into the axiom of choice. And uh, we all know how controversial that axiom is, but I suppose we're just going to sort of use it as a way to prove that. So use the axiom of choice to prove that theorem one is true. That's an exercise for you guys. So um, actually, us, uh, uh Professor um, Bruno Zimmerman proved it in his lecture. Okay, so you guys can just check that out. I think I'm going to link it down in the description. I think it's lecture 12 or 13, 14, somewhere around there, if I remember correctly. Okay, so I'll now write a picture. So we have uh, an abelian block A of uh, infinite amount of fanboys, and then we treat each fanboy as a natural number of some number line. So now let's say we have some starting fanboy M. So this is our infimum for the entire thing. And so we keep going on and on and on until we reach our first infinity. Our first infinity, which is A N omega. So this this over here is just A N. This entire section here, which is F1, F2, F3, or just one, two, three, four, five, and then so on and so forth. Not including zero, of course. Uh so well. And it's basically just, well, C, uh, excluding its, uh, well, C, C, excluding its negative version, so minus C. Um, and zero, I think. That's how I was like in the comments. Okay, so after we your first infinity A and omega, we just keep going. You apply this again. We just copy and paste it. And then we have a second infinity, our set, our third infinity, actually. Oh no, second infinity, which is a n 
it's not all magma. And then you, know, you can you can reapply this again and again, and then until we treat these a n omegas as numbers themselves, and then we go on and on until we reach r, well r to the n infinity, which is a n omega squared, and then a n omega cubed, and then on and on, a n omega cubed, and then on and on, and then we get to a n omega to omega and then you know, just keep applying it on and on but the thing is if we keep applying it on and on and this entire thing is actually called or the if we can begin with it's actually called a and big omega as you can see we just basically applied the concept of omega big omega and bigger infinities to our uh, study here and the thing is, if we continue applying the well-ordering principle or well-ordering theorem to this entire thing and just keep copying, copying, and then, you know, finding bigger, bigger infinities, it happens to fail. I mean, do you, see, do you notice the problem that, um, well, eventually, if we treat the entire set here, this entire A and as some infinite thing, it's not well-ordered anymore because there is no supremo. Because every well-ordered set or... Yeah, well, or the set in our context re requires a supremo. It needs an, a, an upper bound, basically. It needs an upper bound. And the thing is, if we continue applying this principle, there will be no upper bound because every successive or thing that appears to be the upper bound has some immediate success. So if we want this, if we want A and here to be well ordered principle, uh, or to be well ordered, and so our lemma, lemmas one and two will work. We require that a n omega has a upper bound or supremum. If without that supremum, that must one and two fail. So let's do that. Let's define a supremum. So yeah, this is actually lemma two point one. So that's what I said is lemma two point one. If there does not exist a supremum for this a n omega, a n omega is not well ordered. So, and since it, if it's not well ordered, these subsets of it or these elements of it have no successors. So this shouldn't have a successor. This should have a successor. This should have a successor. And so lemmas one and two fail as lemma two point one. So basically, lemma two point one states that the well ordering principle fails if a and omega has no supremum. And so lemma three now fixes this with defining a supremum. And if we do define a supremum, this becomes something known as limit point compact. So it's compact at uh, at the limiting point x. And yeah. So lemma three. Lemma three. What is this? Lemma three. Lemma three, define a supremum of A and omega, uh, big omega, so that's not what be equal to, we define the B S of A and omega. This could be anything you guys can think of. So, uh, yeah, some infinity or something. It could be any, it's arbitrary. Um, but not, of course, that it doesn't have one. Not in the case where it doesn't have one. Uh, so, yeah. Now the interval. The interval. The interval F included S A M omega is limit point go back. And of course, it's compact because it both both supremum and infimum for this interval is part of it. <laughs> because if one of them is not part, it's it's immediately not compact. That's a very like very simplified but like sort of uh, intuitive way to think about compactness. If you're given an interval over here or a set, if the upper and lower bounds are not part of the set, it's not compact. Or if one of them are not part, it's not compact already. But since both of the limits here, the the infimum and the supremum are part, then it's compact. Okay, that's lemma three, and we still have a, a long ways to go. 
we still have to define our fourth definition, uh, which is about REL and then definition of five and another theorem that's that, that I said would be important about manifolds. So, results. Okay, definition four. There exists a countable, well-ordered set REL composed of string concatenations of the language L such that each string concatenation defines or describes a type of relationship. So, in example, uh, a monogamous relationship or a marriage, a civil union, or a polyamorous relationship. Uh, their base, their abbreviations, or their the their sort of definitions or abstractions are part of this REL set. So that is four. Definition four. I will use a black. Let's use some black. Let's use blue. Definition four. The four. There exists a REL. All blackboard both face. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Let's use the one. Okay. So definition four. There exists. There exists a countable one ordered set. Well, ordered set RDL. REL such that uh, that is composed alpha inside the clean star operation over our language L. Or an alphabet L. The both of some A inside L, we're in A is some string concatenation uh, such that alpha describes a relationship. Okay, so yeah, describes a relationship and all that stuff. Okay. Okay, so yeah, then I should kind of pop it back, I'm not sure. Okay, so yeah, that's one. So there are some abbreviations I, I need you guys to know about. So simplifications or uh, some denotations basically of some relationships which we will map subsets of A onto. So um, first one is the monogamous monogamous relationship so mono now notice these are, these are string concatenate, concatenations of elements from you know elements from you know our language L so mono mono for the monogamous relationship now we're looking at that again Mono, monogamous relationship, and then next abbreviation is poly. You already know what that is. Poly polyamorous. Yeah, polyamorous. And then mar, m a r, like march, is a marriage or a civil union. So it's a description of a relationship, right? They say, we're, we're married, we're a couple, right? Marriage, mar, uh, now, um, also specific stuff like mar m, which means a monogamous marriage. Mar with a small m, mono marriage. And then so, mar p, Is our poly poly marriage that exists? I think, and then you know so on and so forth. But these are the main things that we want, right? And of course, there's also the 
one, two, three, because we um, we also want to state the sort of how many people are inside the relationship, right? We also want to say the cardinality. So cardinality of a, of an abelian block is also a part of it. So mono mono um, uh, poly mar m and mar p. Are all elements of well R E L and also N is a is a subset, but not the entirety of R E L because we also want to state because the description uh, part of describing a relationship is saying how many people are inside it. So two people are inside the relationship, three people are inside of it, and we want to say natural numbers because we cannot say one half people are inside the relationship. Uh, one and one half people are inside the relationship. That doesn't make sense. It's like we're gonna have the person. No, that doesn't make sense. So it has to. The people has to be whole, and so the the uh, amount of them has to be specified in some real manner. You know, something that's concrete in a concrete manner. So we're using the natural numbers, and also we cannot say there are no people inside the relationship. We can't say there's zero people inside. So that's why we don't use the integers, and we. <laughs> Uh, of course, we cannot say there are minus two people inside the relationship, right? Because it's like we're missing two people in the relationship and we're in. We don't even have a single person inside there. Yeah, so yeah. And the thing is, um, minus relationships are basically just not. They're just equal to zero, right? So, might as well just use the natural numbers and all that. It's fair to use the natural numbers. So it's more. it feels more concrete for you guys. But if you want, you can definitely um, define one that is, uh, you can definitely define a relationship that is, well, you know, an abstract form of relationship, an abstract relationship that is outside the realm of the natural numbers. and can be extended to real numbers. Um, you can extend relationships basically to real numbers. Um, actually, integers, not real numbers. So it's some concrete value. Or maybe you can, we can define the absolute value of Z to be an element of R E L. Basically. Okay. So next is definition five, which is now our relationship. Our relationship is an abelian abelian block A equipped with a morphism psi. So okay, I'm actually putting it up in here already. So uh Definition five. A relationship is an abelian block. A equipped equipped with some morphism. which I will call Psi uh, that maps right down here yep you guys cannot see that uh, uh, there you guys can see it now so Psi that maps 8 tuples onto REL Cross dot dot cross A on two R E L. So this is why we needed R E L because we defined there's some metric over A or well, yeah there is some metric A that takes two people right or two constituents of a relationship and then in the maps onto R E L. And so well another description of a relationship is whether two pairs inside of it is part of a relationship. So let's say uh, two names, Amanda and John, say. Let's say Amanda and John are girlfriend and boyfriend, right? And then they're part of a monogamous relationship, which is uh, Stacy and uh, Patrick. Stacy, Patrick, uh, Amanda, and John are all in the relationship. They're all inside one abelian block. And so, one other description of their relationship is saying that, well, we have a combination or a union of two monogamous relationships. And so, one of the monogam monogamous relationships is um, Stacy and John. Yes. 
uh, I mean Stacy and Patrick or Amanda and John. So Amanda and John are are a subset of that a billion block, and they're being mapped on the REL, and that their image under this morphism is basically well, they are part of that a billion block basically. And that's that's technically a part of REL because it does describe what their relationship is with respect to everyone's relationship. So with respect to uh, with respect to uh, Patrick and the other girl's uh, relationship. I'm not good with names. <laughs> so that's that. So um, so yeah, um, it maps pairs from A onto REL, and so now. Psi satisfies these two conditions. One, one, there exists a psi to the minus one, or there exists some inverse uh, one that maps REL or REL tuples EL and on two AN or A cross cross A N times. So it assigns a relationship status or description to uh, couples inside a relationship. So yeah, it's just the inverse. And this inverse applied to this gives us a one the identity morphism. And that and that yeah, that's the second that's the second definition. There exists some identity morphism. Such that if it's composed with psi, it just gives us psi. And this identity morphism, one psi, maps A onto itself. Or it fixes every element in A onto itself. So one psi. So for all that, alpha inside A. Alpha is just fixed onto itself by side or one side or the identity the identity map one side all right first off rigorous um, or mathematical definition of alpha a relationship right there or abstract definition at least so now here's my dad again um, now very important theorem theorem number two and that theorem number two is yeah what I said about the important the important thing about the manifold. So okay, so this may be a bit this may be a bit uh, heavy. So you guys you guys prepare yourselves. So theorem two theorem two okay we're actually running out of ink again. I hate it that. I hate that this happens. Okay. Let S equals A T A where T A is the topo the topology over an abelian block. Okay. Be a topological rep relationship. Be a top relationship. So not top <laughs> it's a topological relationship. With a predefined Predefined, uh, predefined boundary, which is which I will call del S, which is P last P uh, P upper P lower. Do you remember that the infimum supremum of our S? Okay. So the construction S uh, and its boundary. It's an n manifold. It's an n manifold. I'll use a different marker for this. Where n equals the amount of basis in the topology over A. 
So um, the amount of basis over the function A determines the dimension of the manifold, you know, generated by this structure over here. And so, yeah. Now the proof for this, so now let's do the proof. Now you guys know by definition that a manifold is a is a topological space that is locally that is locally isomorphic to subsets of R. Now notice, notice, notice that we have a map between you know A, a relationship, and N or R A L. Because we established a while ago, we said a while ago that N, the natural numbers, is an element or is a subset of REL and since N is a subset of REL and N is a subset of R that means we, we are essentially mapping our topological space onto R or onto subsets of R which is N and so since that is the case we essentially have a manifold so that's very neat proof so I write the proof so now, um, now to make it more precise, I'm not gonna write anymore. I'm just, I'm just gonna well sort of sketch it. So to make things precise, to make our morphism precise, let's define let's define psi to be the cardinality operator. This. Or basically find the size of a relationship. A. So A sharp or the absolute value of A. Basically, this tells us the size of it, how many part, how many people are inside of it, and since this over here is an element, or so these two are an element of the real numbers, or are the natural numbers, and since n is an element of the real numbers, we essentially have a mapping from well our, our set A onto R, and since we have that mapping, we can say that it is isomorphic to R because there is an isomorphism that maps this onto R and equivalently there is an inverse morphism which maps a number onto this onto this set or into this abelian block and that number is basically the amount of people are inside of it right there's an inverse so that means that these two are isomorphic so A is isomorphic to R because we can map it onto N and since we can map it onto N and N is a subset of R we are essentially mapping A onto R, or subsets of R. And since we can map it onto subsets of R, we can map subsets of A onto R, we essentially have what is called a manifold, which is, well, defined rigorously as some topological space that can be mapped onto R. So we have a clean projection. So if we think of it as a shape, we have some clean projection onto N dimensions of R, or Rn. And so that's a very neat, that's a very neat thing. Sorry, I need to hold. Excuse me. Uh -huh. So, and... Okay. So, yeah, that's a very neat proof. And that's the end of our lecture. So, I find it very neat that we're able to actually connect these things. And then, you sort of apply them into a proof of a theorem. So, I guess I'll end the lecture here. And I'll see you guys in the next one.